to learn great stuff. Um, so can I ask the steering committee to stand up just so people know who they are? Um, oh, stand up. It's <laughs> exercise. Yeah. Christine, uh, uh, Christine Drennan, Belma Pena. Um, introduce yourself. Colin Jones. Uh, Tony Garcia. Terry Vines. And the person that's not here is Butch. So, and Ricky Fishner is also. And Ricky Fishner, who took their name, is here as well. Um, thank you for coming on such a rainy day. Um, we have a social, we have a meeting um, in October, and we're going to formally launch our website. I don't know if any of you had a chance to look at it, but there's some amazing things that will help neighborhoods, I think, help make the decisions for themselves. Um, on December 1st, mark your calendar, it's our neighborhood social. So it'll just be about talking and eating and getting to know each other, and that will be the first of December at the uh, Conservation Society Hall. But I'll be sending out messages to you. Can I, Tony? You want to talk about the uh, website really quickly? Sure. <clears throat> Again, uh, my name is Tony Garcia. I'm on the steering committee. Uh, I just want to advise folks that uh, we have saved the day for October 20th. This is Saturday. Uh, the menu is to, to be determined, but the intent is to have the official launch of the uh, Tier 1 Neighborhood Coalition website. Uh, currently, the website is under construction, but there's quite a bit of information that's currently on the website. On the 20th, we're going to take a really deeper dive, uh, uh, dive on the, uh, uh, the demographic data of neighborhoods that's posted, that's currently being posted on the website. Uh, also, the workshops, the T1NC workshops, are currently on the website, so neighborhoods can use that as, as, as a reference. We're also going to have the forum, the open forum for neighborhood input on the 20th as well. So we like to have uh, neighborhood input photographs of neighborhoods so we can post on the website. And the intent really is to promote the neighborhood or the T1NC uh, mission statement and elevate the concerns of our neighborhoods here in San Antonio. So uh, just save the date, October 20th, Saturday, uh, in the venue is to be confirmed. Okay? So if you have an opportunity, check uh, the website. It's T1NC.org. And there's quite a bit of information that you can currently use on the website. Thank you. <laughs> you know, our, our role is um, to help neighborhoods self-educate so that you're able to talk to the city and have more information and be able to advocate for the needs um, for your own neighborhood. And so when we use these, when you, you can go on the website. If you want any of us to visit your neighborhood association to talk about any of the issues, we certainly can. But our role is to help you educate yourselves, us to educate each other and our own neighborhoods. So let's get started. Um, Anissa, there are a couple of people I want to thank before we get started. Anissa Shell of Tobin Hill is the person responsible for today's presentation. Um, she worked with Monica Sabino and David Vogel. Uh, uh, Monica is from Dignity Hill, David Vogel is from Alta Vista. Terry Ibanez helped procure the uh, menu for today. Terry? And uh, uh, she provided the coffee, her organization provided the coffee. Uh, Brian Ortiz, who's the branch director of this YMCA, also helped. We always want to thank Drea Garza of Monticello Park, who does the printing for us. We could not afford, you know, we're not a nonprofit with money. So um, other than the coffee fund, this was invaluable and this made a difference. We want to thank the Department of Neighborhood and Housing Services and the Mayor's Office for providing the booklets. Today, they were kind enough to print some off so that each one of you could have one. We also, of course, want to uh, uh, thank Nowcast and um, Charlotte Ann Lucas, and they always need your support. Um, they are an organization that, when they, they put these videos online and we're able to access them, and that is a very, very expensive process, and they always can use your help, especially coming up. There's going to be a couple. Drive. So please, when you see that they need money, if you can kind of put it out there and help them, that's they're a nonprofit. So thank you. Um, let's get started. Lisa, would you like to come on up? Sure. Okay. Good morning. Um, I'm Anissa 
myself. I am a board member for the Seven Hill Community Association, um, and um, I also am the person that filed for the historic designation of Seven Hill North, um, which failed to be council. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that in my presentation. Um, I was also a member of um, one of the technical working groups for the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. And um, I recently did part of this presentation at the Housing Summit um, with David Goble and Juan Pesavino, as well as Mrs. Conrad from William. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is a little bit of the housing recommendations and how it fits in with um, the concept of infill design. Um, infill is something that's really affecting all of our inner core neighborhoods. And um, so I wanted to give you some perspectives on that. Um, go ahead, Cynthia. <laughs> so we want to talk about what is affordable. Um, when we're talking about affordable housing, a lot of times people have certain ideas, um, and we want to make sure we're all starting from the same page. So affordable housing is housing that costs no more than 30% of a household's income. Um, it should include rent and utilities, as well as transportation costs for um, renters, or if it's a homeowner, that's going to include the principal and interest on your mortgage, insurance, property taxes, utilities, and transportation. Um, and that transportation piece is really important because um, if you live far away from where you work, your transportation costs are going to be more, whether that's a bus pass, a car payment, insurance, maintenance, gas, all of that. Um, we use the term AMI, that stands for Annual Median Income. In San Antonio, the updated number is about $55,000 per year for a household of three. That's usually not two earners, that's usually a single mom and two kids in San Antonio. Um, So affordable housing depends on income, and affordable housing is attainable housing. So we want everyone in our city to be able to live in a home that they can afford, something that they can attain. It's not just for poor people, it's not just for the lowest income, it's for all of us. Everybody deserves a place to live. Um, in your packet you have um, a color handout from the Mayor's Housing Policy Task Force. Um, the task force uh, was a very inclusive public process. Um, we started at the end of last year. Um, and really the goal was to understand the magnitude of the problem here in San Antonio. And the process was really dri um, driven by data. We had um, great teams of uh, consultants that helped us get data. We had SA20, um, a lot of work went into this to really understand what was going on. And one of the things that we saw is that a third of San Antonio households are cost burden, meaning they're spending more than 30% of their income on housing and transportation. Okay. So we're going to um, median home prices are rising here in San Antonio a lot faster than incomes are, so it's really creating um, a gap for being able to afford homes. Uh, this is not sustainable. Um, we're obviously going to be in big trouble if things continue as it is, and that's what this uh, Venn diagram is represent. The gap. Uh, so the Housing Task Force created this framework as a way to be proactive, so that we can hopefully get ahead of this problem, and we don't end up um, like some of the cities around the country that have had worse housing problems than us. So who is affordable housing for? Um, the focus of the task force is really on the 60 to 120 percent AMI group. That means um, if if you're making $55,000 a year and you're a mom with two kids, you're making 100 percent AMI. Um, that's about the salary of a school teacher. So this is really workforce housing. We're talking about housing for teachers, for firefighters, for police officers. Uh, we're talking about housing for healthcare workers. Um, and this sheet you have in your packet as well, so you can look closer at it. Um, it breaks it down by the different percentages of AMI. 
Um, and it has some of the top occupation uh, for those different groups, so you can look closer at that when you have time. Right at the 80 to 100 percent is a school teacher. So when we're talking about affordable housing, we're talking about housing for our neighbors. We're not talking about any other group. We're talking about people that are already in our community. So um, this this slide uh, shows a breakdown by council districts. So you can see, if you look at your city council district, you can see what the needs are, where you live, and what's going on with your neighbors. Uh, it breaks it down. This, the first one on this side breaks it down by the number of renter households, the number of homeowner households, the total number of housing units, and how many vacant units there are um, in each council district. And then on this side, uh, it, sh it shows you the number of cost burden households in your district. So how many households are struggling to pay their rent or their mortgage, or who are having a hard time getting to work because their mortgage is too high, or their rent is too high. Or the property taxes are going um, The median rent in San Antonio is about $940 dollars a month and it takes an eighteen dollar an hour job to be able to afford that. Nine hundred and eighty a month, eighteen dollar an hour job. Um, pages fifteen through twenty four in your framework. Really examine all of these details closely. You can take this home and look at it and really to really get a good picture of the need in San Antonio. Again, all of this is based on hard data. So Take a look at it and encourage everyone to read through this. There's a lot here. More than we can go over today. The task force came up with five overarching recommendations. Um, and each of those is broken down into a policy recommendation and then strategies on how to get there. The five overarching recommendations are creating a coordinated housing system, um, which would be kind of like a one-stop. We already have something like this in the in development services down on 19 and 1 South Alamo. We want to create something like this for housing, where people who provide housing um, can all be in one place and people who need housing can come to that same place to get help, fill out one application, and be matched up with housing in the city. We also want to create an online portal, which would facilitate this as well. Um, the second one is increasing city investments. Um, this includes programs like the C-CHIP program, the um, ICRIP program, and um, really just dedicating funding to this um, problem. The third, was, the third one is increasing affordable housing production, rehabilitation, and preservation. And that's what we're really going to focus on today, so I'll go into that more. The fourth one is promoting and protecting neighborhoods. Um, and this uh, it, that sounds like what we should be focusing on here, but really that's about um, protecting the people who are most vulnerable in our neighborhoods. So special populations such as um, children aging, aging out of the foster care system, uh, seniors, veterans, the homeless, the, the people that are having the most challenges right now in getting housing. Um, and the fifth one is ensuring accountability to the public. We want the system to be transparent, um, and we want to be able to make sure that when promises are made to the public, those promises are kept. So, like I said, we're going to focus today on increasing affordable housing production and rehabil production, rehabilitation, and preservation, which was the third recommendation. Um, and in the framework, that's pages 36 through 40. So if you guys want to slip over to that, so I'll help you. Have a couple more chairs. This is true. All right. So um, the first policy recommendation is to stabilize the homeownership rate in San Antonio by increasing the production, preservation, and rehabilitation of affordable housing. And the way they want to do this is to prioritize city funding and incentives for homeownership. Um, and for households up to 120% AMI. Uh, they also want to increase funding for down payment assistance and home buyer counseling, increase funding for housing rehab programs like the owner-occupied rehab program, the under one roof program, 
um, and minor repair. The second policy recommendation under this heading is to increase rehabilitation, production, and preservation of affordable rental units. They want to build more. Um, and again, prioritizing city, city funding and incentives on rent restricted units, um, which means they don't want someone to say, oh, it's going to be affordable because it's only $700 a month, but then you find out it's a studio and it's only 400 square feet, and no one with two kids can live in that for that amount. Um, they also want to prioritize funding for new rental units in communities that are linked with transportation, jobs, and cultural assets. So that means um, looking forward, if we're looking at you know, the regional centers and the comp plan where they want to develop more transportation hubs, they're going to want to concentrate more housing in those areas so that it makes, it, it makes sense so that people can get to their jobs. If they have easy access to transportation, it's going to decrease their overall spending on housing. They want to create housing opportunities for the most vulnerable residents, including the homeless, seniors, youth aging out of foster care system, etc., and um, increase funding for service and rich housing. And the last part of that is removing barriers to the production of affordable housing. They want to undertake an inclusive public process to determine standards and criteria to allow buy right zoning for housing development in which 50% of units are affordable. Should be form based. No, that's not what it says. Okay. Um, and it says exempt affordable housing units from soft impact fees and revise the UDC to remove regulatory barriers to affordable housing. So, what is the city doing today? Um, they are changing <coughs> currently the C chip and ICRIP uh, updates, and that is going to go to city council on. October 11th. Um, a lot of people probably have already heard updates on that if they live in one of the neighborhoods that is being affected by it. If they haven't, I'm going to give like the briefest overview about it. Um, I'm not an expert in that, but um, I do have contact information to get in touch with the city if it's something that affects you and you're concerned about it. Um, the next thing coming up is the revising the UDC to remove the regulatory barriers to affordable housing. There's going to be a technical working group formed, and that's going to be forming uh, in October. Um, and the recommendation on that is for the mayor and city council to establish a technical working group composed of informed community members and experts with technical knowledge in development, zoning, and regulation. So if that's something that you're interested in, get educated, get in touch with your council person. Um, and the second thing will be the public process to determine the standards and criteria to allow by rate zoning for housing development in which 50% of units are affordable. And that committee will be forming in November of this year. Um, same thing, it's going to be uh, the mayor and city council appointing that committee. So the IPRIP um, is now going to be known as the fee waiver program. Um, ICRIP stands for Any Inner City Reinvestment in Fill Policy. Um, it used to be um, that it had a boundary, and now it's going to be citywide. Um, if it includes one of these four components, affordable housing, owner-occupied rehabilitation, historic rehabilitation, or business development. Um, and under historic rehabilitation, there's also legacy businesses, which are businesses that have been in business for 30 years or more. Um, this is something that we can actually, any any of us here could benefit from if you meet any, if you meet these qualifications. So if you live in a historic district, um, you can, and you're um, doing something substantial to your property, if you have a vacant lot in a historic district, you may be able to qualify for these fee waivers. The fee waivers include SAWS impact fees, which are, the fees that SAS charges to connect you to city water. Um, they are considered, they are waiving these fees if you qualify for the program to help encourage infill development um, and make it easier. Um, one thing with that, uh, by the way, is that there is a little note down there that says um, short term rentals will not be able to get um, that incentive. 
So if, you, if someone's planning to develop a property to use as a short-term rental, um, when the, the short-term rental ordinance passes and a permit is needed for a short-term rental, they won't be able to get a short-term rental permit on that property. Short-term rental, meaning how many? Oh, how long is? Okay. Well, yeah, Airbnb. When I say short-term rental, I don't mean like a six-month rental. I mean um, like Airbnbs or vacation rental by owner, home away. Sh super short term. Anything less than 30 days. Yeah. People like doing vacation rentals. Uh, the C chip update. Uh, C chip is city center housing incentive program. And um, it used to be, it was created, it was suggested in 2010 when um, we started the decade of downtown. And the focus was on adding housing downtown. Um, in 2012, it was adopted, and um, it was incentives for any high-density housing projects. Um, it was an as-of-right program, which meant if developers qualified for these programs, they received the incentives without going through um, a, a lengthier process with the city to apply for them. Um, so it was really created to encourage development um, in our downtown area quickly. Uh, and it worked. We've had a lot of development in our downtown. So downtown has really changed. Um, it, it had three parts. The SOSB waivers, uh, tax reimbursement grant, which was the city only taxes could be reimbursed for up to 15 years. And um, so that's not schools, that's not county taxes. It's only just the city portion. Um, and a low interest loan or grant for including mixed use. So if it was going to have retail on the bottom and residential on top, they could qualify for more. Um, but so to address the changes, the boundaries are being reduced. Originally, it was 36 square miles, which was like the original boundary of San Antonio. Um, then it went down to 5.4 miles in 2016. Um, now it's going down to 2.6 miles. So it's just this orange boundary that you see right here. Um, and part of the reason for that is the neighborhoods were pushing back saying that the city was incentivizing um, rezoning for infill in a way that was negatively impacting our neighborhoods. We were feeling like it was creating displacement issues and uh, so this was reduced partially to address that. Um, the new proposal um, removes areas of low urban low density and medium density, um, and uh, no rezoning will be, uh, if you have to rezone the property, then you won't qualify for the incentive. So if we go to the next slide. Um, there's some, the neighborhood preservation part of it um, is what's going to be a positive change for us, I feel. Um, it's, um, no longer incentivizing those projects that have to be rezoned from like a single family use to I and D. They won't be qualified for this incentive any longer. Um, and they are now going to be subject to a design review process. And um, all projects uh, that would be for a short term rental would be ineligible. And I put uh, Chris Lazaro's contact information up here because this is like the lightest version of this program overview ever. Uh, um, this is actually here. But if you live in one of the neighborhoods, could you go back to that back one? Okay. If you live in one of the neighborhoods that are on this map, um, I have a couple, I have about 12 extra copies of the map and sort of a slight overview of this. Um, and the city has been really great about sending people out to do um, presentations to explain this program. To people, so um, please reach out if you are interested in more information on that. And again, who? Chris Lazaro, and his contact information is up here. He's with the Center City Development and Operations Department. I assume these, uh, th this presentation is going to be shared with everyone with the slides. Mm -hmm. um, we can look at putting it on the. It's going to be website. on our website. Yeah. Okay. Everything we ever do is going to be on the website, so you can go back and view okay. and, and 
Yeah. I'll be posted over the weekend. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so what is form-based code? And the reason we're talking about form-based code is because when you dig down into um, the framework, when they talk about by right zoning, they're talking about form-based code. Uh, the form-based code uh, defines form-based code as a land development regulation that fosters predictable built results and a high quality public realm by using physical form rather than separation of uses as the organizing principle for the code. A form-based code is a regulation, not a mere guideline, adopted into city, town, or county law. A form-based code offers a powerful alternative to conventional zoning regulation. So did you, you want to translate that again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> again, so, the same English and Spanish. Well, actually, Spanish we're going to, she's going to be. Yeah. That's, that's going to be the focus of the remainder of the presentation, because okay. I think that's something that all of us are really concerned about. I know many of us are, anyway. So um, go ahead and do the next. So according to the Form Based Codes Institute, uh, this is this is language now from the framework. By right zoning is critically important to increasing housing affordability at all levels of the housing spectrum. To accomplish this, conventional zoning codes should be updated to form based codes that effectively prescribe the outcome desired by the community. Form based codes regulate the form of the buildings in a prescriptive manner at a sufficient level of detail so that the outcome is predictable. This means that the conventional design review process is unnecessary, enabling by right review. To accomplish this, communities should create a detailed community vision, write prescriptive regulations, and enable a by right approval process. So form-based codes specify how developments should look. It's less concerned with the use. They don't care if it's a coffee shop or a barber shop. They care about how it fits in to the streets surrounding it. And form-based codes are predictable. The process is streamlined to allow more housing to be built faster without going through the typical process that we have now. And the results are predictable. So the builder knows what they have to do in order to go through this process and get it streamlined. And the community knows what the results are going to look like. There shouldn't be any surprises. Like an it's very similar to an NCD. So the chaos is at the beginning, right? Everyone gets together when you're making an NCD and says, this is what we want our neighborhood to look like. Here are all of our rules. What's an NCD? An NCD is a neighborhood conservation district, which are standards that communities write themselves. Um, to it's a zoning overlay right now, and it becomes ordinance. So, so you you get together over years time. Everybody sort of works on what they want, things they want to preserve about their neighborhoods. In my neighborhood, it was front porches, was one of the biggies, and then it's written into code. So, when someone pulls a permit, they have to abide by those specific things. Correct. Unless the board of adjustment grants it. Exactly. Well, that's that. But so we'll, we're going to talk about that later. Let's just right. wrap it there and then we'll talk about how with form based code. So similar to um, what we just said with the state chip program being as of right, if they meet the requirements of the form-based code, then they would go through the process smoothly. If they want to do something that's different, that's outside of what the code prescribes, which that what the code details out that says these are the rules you have to follow, it has to have this height and be set back this far from the street, and it has to have a front porch and that it can't be made out of cardboard, then you, would have to, then they would have to go through the process if they're trying to do something outside of that. If they're meeting all their requirements, it's going to be smooth. And that's if this passes. We're going to have time to discuss this after we're done with the presentation. So, so form-based codes address development patterns. The development pattern is the geometry of the buildings and spaces. So this is West Craig. And you can see these are the original houses, and these are the new development. And when you look at it this way, you can see that the new development is really outside of the development pattern. Now, this did go through an NCD, but um, ideally, with a form-based code, the details of it would be um, worked out at the beginning, 
in a way that this wouldn't get through, or if it did get through, it would have to go through the Board of Adjustment process. It would have to go through a rezoning process or a design review process in order to be built. So, this brings us to infill development and preserving neighborhood character and integrity. So we do need housing at every income level, from down to the 30% and below, to above 120% AMI. Um, and affordability includes transportation, and it must be sustainable. And that can't happen if we keep annexing the city and going further and further out, because those transportation costs are getting greater and greater. It's also creating a bigger burden on our city's resources. So it makes sense to have infill development. And that means more housing in our inner core neighborhoods. The challenges that we are often facing is the removal of our affordable housing that already exists for luxury homes, um, infill with homes that are, are not attainable. Um, and that's what we want. So we want homes that are attainable, and we want homes infill, infill homes that are compatible with the surrounding neighborhood. Um, prescribing building and city form is what we need to do to preserve and enhance our neighborhood's respective characters. So that means getting together at the beginning of the process, similar to how a neighborhood conservation district is created, and laying out what that would look like. Um, and we think it would look like something that's compatible, sustainable, and affordable. Can you go back? Mm -hmm. You're going ahead too fast. Sorry. That's okay. So um, we want design for compatibility. Um, one of the things that's often talked about is the missing middle housing. That's going to be duplexes, triplexes and fourplexes, um, little courtyard apartments, things that we actually have in our neighborhood already. Um, go ahead to the next slide. So here's some examples of some of the missing middle housing. Um, and these, these slides right here, uh, David Vogel shared with me. But, so you can see like there's a duplex, a side-by-side -side duplex, a stack duplex, there's a little bungalow court, um, small multiplexes. I think if you drive around any of our older legacy neighborhoods, you're going to see things, similar things to that. Um, next slide. But one of the challenges is things like what's happening in Mickey Park, or what has happened in Mickey Park. This was um, a duplex on Claremont. Actually, there's two of them. You can Plex. see the fourplex. Those are fourplexes. Okay, so fourplexes on Claremont. So that means eight families are living in these two structures, and there's a lot of space in between the fourplex and the single-family homes on either side of it. Those were demolished and replaced with these. So these are people are calling them the skinny houses. They're single-family homes. They're designed to be. They're, they're really being marketed toward a different demographic than the people that were living in those four places. So they're replacing residents. The people who were living in Minky Park, sending their kids walking distance to a really great school. Lamar Elementary is arguably one of the best elementary schools in SAISD. Um, they, they were walking distance from there. Now they can't afford to live in this neighborhood. If you go to the next slide. Anisha, do, you, do you know how much those sold for? Over an hour or $400,000. Did everyone hear that? So those, those, those sort of like double story shotguns or reading houses, I think you're calling them cottages, are selling for around $400,000. And they're becoming rentals. And that is true. And as you can see right here, go to the next one. You can see right here, this is from Zillow. Yes. This is from Zilla uh, just last weekend. Um, this this house on Claremont is for rent for $24.50. It's a three-bedroom house. This duplex, one side of it is a two-bedroom. It's for rent for $8.50. That's a huge gap, an incredible gap. Somebody who is <clears throat> affording $8.50, if they're affording it within their 30% and aren't cost burden, there's no way they can just jump up to that price. No way. Um, children, we, we have heard stories of children being displaced just from these grade schools and having to leave the neighborhood. We've had stories of people who left Mankey Park and went to Soapworks and they were displaced again. So this is a real problem. 
So, is your neighborhood's missing middle housing missing, or is it already there and just missing from your neighborhood's redevelopment projects? There are some great redevelopment projects that have happened. I know one that's right on the border of Monta Vista and Southern Hill, where they redeveloped one of these um, little multi-family homes. It looks great. Um, but oftentimes, we're not seeing it. There, I want to show some local examples of this in, our, in some of our neighborhoods. So you can see this is housing that fits in with the neighborhood. <clears throat> oh, this is, first I'll show you this. Um, this is an example. The yellow houses are the multi-family houses, the missing middle houses. So this is an example of infill, mid-block infill, where you have missing middle houses next to single-family homes. You can tell it works. The, the houses have... Um, really good massing. They're still spaced far apart from one another. They're not crowded together. The setbacks match, so they're set back on the street um, in a similar way. The heights are in a similar scale. There's no, there's nothing popping up. There's no towers in the middle of the street. Well, traditionally in our older neighborhoods, the parking is usually in the rear of the units. Um, we, the the concept of creating parking lots for housing, um, especially you know the Complexes is relatively new to our city. Um, usually, I mean, you can't really see it on this diagram, but I do have an illustration later where you can see parking can be addressed in creative ways that aren't taking over the front of the house. Um, I think that's something that stands out with those uh, skinny cottage houses in major parks is instead of having the front porch up front and neighbor to neighbor interaction. The parking, the cars are up front, the garage is up front, and it's an attached garage. So people can just drive in, go in their house, and they never have to see their neighborhoods. So it really, yeah, it's a really a suburban design in our urban neighborhoods. This is another example of the multi-families being used as more of a transition zone. So you have the single families up top, then the yellow multi-families next, and then you have a commercial zone. Um, after that, and that's that's another way that that can really work. And this is something that is being proposed along the corridors right now. Here's some examples of um, the missing middle housing in our neighborhood. So this is Alta Vista. Um, this is the triplex, and then two fourplexes. And you can see there's setbacks in the street. The parking is going to be in the rear of these as well. This is this looks like. Could be wrong because I'm not familiar with this property exactly, but they probably have a driveway that goes back in between the buildings and they park in the rear. Here's another one in Alta Vista. So you can see the parking's back here around the corner behind the building. Uh, this one's Mickey Park. Um, and they have the parking off to the side, and that's really common as well. Another one in Mickey Park. And just so everyone knows, single family can be infill too. Um, this is Dignity Hill um, on Olive Street. And the great thing here, I mean, it's still being built, but you can see that whoever built this home did a great job matching the setback of the existing house next to it. Um, the form of the house is really similar. It's spaced similarly from its neighbor, and the, the roof line is really similar. It's something that really fits in. This is another example in Dignity. And I don't know if, can, can everyone tell which house is the infill house? <laughs> guesses? Any guesses? So the light on the wind. So on this side, which one is it? The middle one. The middle one, right? But it's it's not that easy to tell. If I didn't have this picture, would you be able to tell? Not It's not obvious. Right? You have to kind of think about it. And that's, that's great. Like it's set back, it has a similar porch sticking out, um, and so it's infill that fits in. Anyone know which one's the infill here? Okay, I heard the red one, I heard the green one. I'm not sure, can't tell. You can get the blue one? It's the green one. Um, I actually looked up this address on Google, and if you look at it today, the picture they have currently, it's still the vacant lot. So you can see this house and this house, and the fence 
on either side of the greenhouse is built, but there's nothing in the middle. It's so cute. So, people do so like who built it? Like, is it a, a, <laughs> a private individual? Or was I it? actually personally don't know, but um, Monica Sabina knows. She has records of all of the um, houses that are being built. 417 North Olive. This is, yeah, 417 North Olive. So, so, so and you said something to remember that these are historic districts. These are. So there is a, a design uh, review process that's happening with this that is aiding that, that compatibility. And that's something that we should definitely keep in mind. Not all of us live in historic districts or have NCDs. I personally don't live in an area that has any kind of design protection. Um, I don't want to advocate necessarily for a form based code, but I, I can say that if we had a form based code, those areas of our city that don't have a conservation district or historic guidelines um, would maybe have a shot of something compatible going in. Here's an example of two houses, two single family homes on one lot. And this is also Dignity. It's on 608 and 610 Dawson. And you can see there's a front house and a back house. But when you are on the street, you can't see the back house really. And the front house is set back Similarly to the houses around it, so those don't have a historic form. Is that like a like a big house in the front, and then it has an additional unit in the back, or is it two? Separate? No, it's two separate single-family homes, and they're similar in size actually. I wish I had a pointer, but the back house you can see it has a really similar. They're almost the same. Like they have um, the balcony up top, the balcony up top, and this one's oriented slightly different, but it's they're very similar houses. Do you know how much those sold for? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But I will tell you that. <laughs> I'm just wondering if there's any little single family homes going in that anybody can actually buy. Well, let's, let's continue. What, what I will tell about. you yeah. is in what's happening in Dignity is a lot of these are happening on lots that are vacant. So they're not tearing out houses. They're building on empty they're infilling vacant lots. But remember, they just got torn about three or four years ago. Yeah. So, and they're just still right below there now, right? Not, yeah. not all of the community, but um, a lot of the community. That's so the territory. It's so bad. 349. Uh, uh, 1,700 square feet, three bedrooms, three beds. Wow. That's almost a four thing to do. Here's another one on 524 North Pine. Anyone know which one's the, the new house and which one's the old house? Well, you can just tell because of the paint on the porch. But it's the, you know, if, if it's if they're set back, yeah, there's no metal work. That was definitely a sign of the times. But, but you know, it's it fits in, right? The house blends in. Just driving down the house, it's not going to pop out at you. It's not going to stick out like a sore thumb. And if, I, I believe that if we could get something, if we could work through the chaos at the beginning, if we can get to a point that we could agree, this might be possible parts of our city. Um, I'm going to talk about a case study, we're going to call it, of what happened on East Mistletoe Avenue. So this is my side of the street. This is where I live. Um, in fact, that house is Bee's house. <laughs> and my daughter's on the street. Um, and uh, one thing I want you to keep in mind here is a lot of times when um, infill development is proposed in our neighborhoods, we often react with, that's too dense, especially if they're trying to read them to IDZ. And so this is just an illustration of some different possibilities. So some background. Um, a developer bought these two duplexes. They're little mid-century duplexes, I think, built in the 40s. Um, this is also on Mistletoe. This yes. is also on Mistletoe. So this is across the street from the houses you just saw. Um, you can see my neighbor's house right there. Uh, she's lived in that house her whole life. And then there are these two little duplexes. The lots here are 25 feet wide, and this is two lots. Um, I'm sorry, 50 feet wide, this is two lots. And the lots are really deep. They're like 160 feet deep. Um, so the parking was in the back. You can tell they drove down the middle. They parked in the area in the back. Um, the developer bought them. They were occupied when they were bought. The, the occupants left. They weren't evicted, but they, I think they just sold writing on the wall and they came to What was being proposed is something that a lot of us have seen. 
They were proposing six two-story single-family homes on the lots that would be facing each other. So they're all facing in with a center drive. So this right here is Mistletoe Street, and this would be the driveway going back, and these go back along the lot. Um, wait, stay there for a second. <laughs> Um, they, in order to do this, they would have had to rezone to IUD, um, and everyone was basically opposed to it. We we were okay with um, some kind of infill there. We did feel like the lot could have more density than it currently held, but we felt like six three-bedroom homes was too much for this space. Um, we were really opposed. We opposed them that zoning, um, and. They pushed forward, so we filed for historic designation, and that initiated a very long process. Um, and ultimately, we didn't have um, enough support from the landlords uh, in the district that we had proposed to make the district happen. Um, so it failed at city council. But during that process, uh, Jim Bailey from Alamo Architects had heard through the grapevine what was going on in our neighborhood, and he reached out to me and said, tell me your concerns. Um, Tell, us, tell me what you need. What is the neighborhood looking for? And so I told him, and he called up the developer of this property, and he said, what do you need? How many units do you have to have? How many square feet, how many square feet do you need to make this project work? And he created a proposal for us. So I want to show you that. So here you can see a street view. This is Mr. Audius's house, and there are the duplexes, and then there are the houses down there. Um, they were torn down, and he proposed this. Um, what he proposed was also six units. Um, it was two sets of duplexes um, and uh, two accessory dwelling units in the back. So go to the next one. From the street, this, this had a really similar feel to it. It had the same setback. He kept those little cute round walkways kind of just of a nod to what was originally there, and the scale was appropriate. So this, the setbacks would have matched the houses on the street on either side. Here's an aerial view. So this kind of addresses the parking. So you can see there's a duplex and a duplex, and then a parking area in the back, which would be completely hidden from the street, and then two accessory dwelling units back there. So those could be replacing the affordable housing we kind of lost. The neighbors love this plan. Yeah, that's really cool. It, it, um, it was single story in the front and it popped up to two stories in the back. So it had the same square footage that the developer was looking for initially, and it had the same number of units. Six units, same square footage. Totally different layout. Um, we loved it. Loved it. And we realized the lot could hold that amount of density. Unfortunately, the developer didn't go for it. Uh, <laughs> it, had been a, it had been a painful process. They dug in, so um, it was dead. We go ahead. So instead of this, we got this. This is so I live across the street from this. I look at it every day. Yes. I do have a question. What do you know? Why the developer decided not to move forward with the redesign, even though the designs were already provided? I do not know. I can't speak to that. Was it the same price? Did you know? Like. I don't, I don't, they basically were not talking to us by that point. Yeah, at that point, our communication had broken down. So Jim had, Jim had taken his design to them, and they, from my understanding, were essentially non-responsive to it. Um, but I can't speak to any of their reasoning. I don't know that. So how many units are there? Six. 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 And they're Nine. all rentals, or they're all... They're yes. still under construction. Um, this is, they started at the end of last year. Or I think, well, they got the okay uh, in August of last year. I think they started at the very, yeah, at the very end of last year. They were foundations and what have you. So they are just, where's the parking for? Uh, each one has parking next to it. So these ones, the front ones have parking behind it. Uh, they all, but they're all garages underneath. So it's like, Partial, it's a partial floor, like partial living space and garage underneath it on the first level. Um, somebody asked something else in it. Chance to get was rental, but it oh, rental. Be for sale. So, so well, I don't actually. We don't know. They well, did not get IBD on the project, so they um, are still down to R and four. They, 
I believe they could do a fee simple sale to someone that's condo because they're all on yeah, they do individual lots. Right, but um, from what I've been told, there's no plans for that yet, and they may be rentals. <coughs> Yes. Yeah. There, there we go. So much I love to, you know, I'm not getting all the answers. Three square feet or eight units? They're between 1350 and 1550 square feet. So, they're, yeah, they're um, each three bedrooms, two bathrooms. Let me see. Anyone have other questions about that before we go forward? I, I have a question. Uh, I made about this historic West Side Resident Association. Where is the West Side been in all this? And we all know where the West Side is, right? We could some of us. We have the poorest area. And I'm wondering, do I leave this meeting or how do I fit in here? How do I tell my residents whether they're this kind of, you know, it, it, and I started coming to this, you know, oh, hold on, I'm sorry. So what I, I'm trying to do, you know, I'm, kind of, I'm coming here with a, a group of passionate people that have been homeowners and working hard folks all their lives, right? So I represent one of the poorest tracks. District 5 is very, most of the social agencies. You know, um, I think some of some of what I take away from here is some of the initial stuff that you talked about. The uh, program that the housing that the city offers, like the under one room. To no, no, I understand. Yeah, yeah, I, I understand that, but there's still houses coming in mm -hmm. being built on these lots. Yeah. That are there, that big of a cost. Yeah. There's flippers and there's all kind of things going on yeah. on the west side. So I just thought I'd put it out there. Well, what this doesn't address, and we'll talk about this more as we as we converse after, because she's almost done here, is the, the affordability component. I mean, right. and Lisa and I, as part of the technical working groups for the housing, I mean, that was one of the things, like, okay, this is great design, so we've made it now easier for developers to come in without a fight from the neighborhood. What does that do to affordability? And that's something we have to talk about. Right. So one thing to keep in mind, well, a couple of things. First is the buy right zoning that's being talked about and form based code that's being talked about in the framework is specifically for affordable housing. So at this point, they're talking about creating a committee to design something and come up with guidelines for something that would be just for affordable housing, not for market rate housing. Well, 50% affordable. It has to be at least 50% affordable. Of course, most of us. Many of us, I think, would realize that that may be something that if they feel it's successful, they would extend to the city overall. So I really want to encourage people to get on those committees. And to attend and those meetings. Attend like those city chairs around it. Yeah. And understand it's there. <laughs> that if the city council is appointing people and you're concerned about your neighborhood, try to get onto the committee. If you don't get onto the committee, show up to the committee meeting. Sitting there and watching and listening gives you information that you can take back to your community. And it also puts the pressure on to make sure that your neighborhood is not forgotten and that your neighborhood is being advocated for. Yes? Yeah, and I, I'm just going to your story in that neighborhood. In this case, since you even got to develop, you know, an architect to come up with something, like how could the city have imposed a mediation between the neighborhood and the developer, because there was something that was so contentious and all of us knew about it, right? And right. some of us came to speak on right. your behalf. And that shouldn't have been built. And it should have been built. And, and they shouldn't have been allowed to build. Like, there should have been some moment that that continued the conversation so that that, that would have been safe. So that, that's also something, I think, in terms of policy or whatever with, right. that you're talking about that we could put more pressure on. I agree. I think we need to hold our city leadership accountable. We need, that's their job. Their job is to come in and represent the citizens in our city first and development and growth second. Development and growth is going to happen, but we want it to be something that is affordable and is sustainable and is compatible. And I think it can be all of those things. I think we just need to fight for it. And we, we want the city to fight on our behalf, and that means we have to pressure them to do so. And you should, yes. um, 
about. So how do we get on with committee? How do we? Well, why don't we take those questions? Yeah, let's take those questions yeah. at the end. Yeah. So the point in showing you this illustration with with my neighborhood. Oh, that's a five foot setback right there. That's. Let <laughs> me go back to that first one. In case anyone wondered what a five foot setback looks like, this is the new house. This is my neighbor Marilyn's house. That she lived in for over sixty years. Yeah. Um. But there is room for infill, and there is room for density if it's done well, right? So we first we said we can't have six houses on those two lots. That would be crazy. But then we saw, well, maybe we actually could have six houses on those lots. If it looked like that, if it was built like that, you know, we're talking about duplexes, four units, and then and then two little houses. Those really could have been affordable. Mm -hmm. They really they could be. If they got the seat chip and did the. Right. They could have. It's a missed opportunity, I think. You know, these developers are saying they can't build it for those prices. And I just can't believe that. Well, if they're going to be providing affordable housing, then hopefully they'll be able to qualify for some of the incentives. And maybe that will happen. They already get the incentives, so. Yeah. They already get them. And that's part of the transparency, is, is holding them. Yes. <laughs> it's all great. But also, it's part of the part of it is holding um, both the developer and the city accountable for those incentives. If they received incentives for a project, we need to know. We need to know what the incentives were. We need to be able to find that information easily without doing an open records request. We should be able to say, hey, did they get an incentive for this project? How much? What were the stipulations? What were the requirements? We want to know. And if they're not meeting them, or if they're providing affordable units, but not putting someone in there that can actually afford it, we need to know. And if they're not going to hold the line, they need to pay back that incentive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm always having something about affordability. But they need to be a slide. Just like you do each of these neighborhoods, out the west side, what they're, what they're doing as far as on the west side. Just like you had here, but provide west side. Maybe, you, maybe we could get together with Lynn and we could put that together. I would like to do that. I, you know, I apologize. I, I basically relied on what I know of where I drive. I'm in Ricky Park all the time. And and I live in Jovan Hill, but you're right, I think we should look at more issues across the city, especially the west side. They are all over. They're on they're coming in the north side, the east side, the south side, they're everywhere. And I, I understand, but I'm for the west side and I challenge you to come take the tour of the west side. And I do want to say that half the Any of us? of these slides are put together as emergencies out of response to something that's happening in that neighborhood. So why you see Alta Vista in there is because we are dealing with a situation right, right now. Right. And you see Maggie Park because they're dealing with a situation right. right now. So we should definitely go see what the situation is on the west side and develop that. that. And we need to share that. People need to know because yeah. I think people, I think it can be really shocking when you see, when you see two cute little duplexes that people could afford and then they're torn down and replaced by six of these houses, or you see that fourplex and it's torn down and replaced by four skinny houses, it's alarming. You realize those are people's homes and people are being displaced and I think we need to talk about what's happening on the west side as well. People need to be aware of what's going on. Could I make a comment? Yes. You know, I, I think what's very, very important is to have engagement from all parts of the city. And so true. What, what's, what's very important here is the, uh, the Tier 1 website. Now, we have gone out asking for information from all the neighborhood associations, all the uh, coalition members, to send information to the website so it can be loaded on the website. So it's really incumbent upon our neighborhood associations to get involved, get the information out to the website so it can spread evenly across the city of San Antonio. Uh, right now, from my perspective, I want to say it's heavily bloated on the north side uh, experience, the problems on the north side, but we need engagement from the west, the west side as well, and the south side of, of, of the city, and the east side. So, I so, appreciate it. So this is, this is a welcome. I mean, this is a welcome. You know, we're going to have a launch October the 20th on the website. We need neighborhood engagement from all parts of the city. We need your input, and this is a great opportunity to get everyone so often we get emails from neighborhoods saying, well, you know, we're having this zoning issue. And this is a place we can put that zoning issue on there 
send a blast out to everybody saying you should go look at the issue. And if that's an issue that's also in your neighborhood, if that's something that you can help, you know, with letters from your neighborhoods or whatever that takes to, you know, go by, stand by their side at, at zoning, then that's a place that we can do that. So it's an organizing tool for neighborhoods who have a lot, which most of us have some of the same issues. We, we learn also, from each other. I think that we're building sort of this coalition of people who um, all bring something different to the table. So if you need help getting the word out, or if you need someone to take pictures or send out stuff for you or get the word out in your neighborhood or get the word out to other neighborhoods, reach out because there are, there are people available to go. Like I can go and take pictures of things. Give me addresses. Let's get it. Let's get the information out there. That's what we're here for, to help each other. Right. So and to educate your one. Tier one neighborhood coalition. Oh, okay. So the website is t1nc.org. That's a good idea. Because for because so what we all can offer, all Teresa can offer a lot of architectural and urban mm -hmm. planning. So that's what we have a lot in our area. Do you hear what she's saying? She's saying maybe the website could also be a place where we have names of people or individuals or, or neighborhood associations that can do specific things. So you know, you can go take pictures, you can offer architectural plans, I can stand around and blah blah about it all day. <laughs> um, I'll take the coffee. Let's, let's finish up here, and, and some of this conversation is relevant to the last part of the presentation. So, um, the last page on the little packet you received is the timeline, and that timeline is also in the framework, and that's where I got that. Um, so, this is something to be aware of. In October, this month, we're going to be, the neighbor and the city council are going to be able to are going to be establishing the technical working groups uh, to look at the UDC and the committee to look at the by right zoning informed based code. There's also going to be other items up there. The Housing Trust Board is supposed to release a request for proposals um, to review the Housing Trust and recommend uh, changes, and um, they're going to present a plan. Uh, for the reconstituted housing commission. November, sorry, November is when the by right zoning uh, committee will be formed. Um, and city council is supposed to be considering a policy to mitigate displacement. So read through this timeline, see what you can do, um, see what you're interested in, and be involved because showing up is incredibly important. So you should be looking for folks in your neighborhood or you that have some knowledge of this. So, you know, there's always that person who's read the comp plan, who's read your neighborhood plan, if you have one, who's done the work, or, and, or understands the issues, like advocating with your council person, this person should be on this committee. Right. Um, so what actions, what other actions can you take? Because we've already been talking about them. So obviously the committee and the technical working group. You can start the conversation within your own neighborhood. Anticipate development. Like Claudia said, a lot, most, almost also this, has been reactionary. The, the developer comes into the neighborhood and the neighborhood reacts. That's what often activates people. That's what activated my street. Um, I think that's what activated. Yeah, and I want to We need to become proactive instead of right. reactive. Exactly. So get together with your neighborhood, your neighborhood association, or the neighbors on your block. Doesn't matter. Get together. And know the development is coming. Know your neighborhood and know where you can have some info. Know where it is vulnerable. Know which which duplex might be going up for sale. Um, and then establish or reinforce your vision. If you don't have a neighborhood plan, figure out what you want your neighborhood to look like. If you do have a neighborhood plan, read it. Know it. Understand it. Understand it backward and forward. Because if you want the city to follow that, and if you want the developers to follow that, you're going to have to be the one who will dictate to the fire. Know your resources and tools. Get familiar with Legistar, um, the city's website. Know who to contact. Know what's going on with zoning and planning, um, land use, neighborhood plans, your NCD standards if your neighborhood has them, um, historic guidelines if your neighborhood's historic. Know who to contact. Create a digital portal of knowledge and resources. Um, so make it simple for homeowners and developers to access you and your vision for your neighborhood. And I'll show an example of that in a second. Um, and encourage developers to approach you, to approach your neighborhood, 
um, and come to you in the early stages of planning. A lot of times we get plans from developers and they already, it's built already in their mind. They, they're they really far along in the process. There are, if their zoning hearing is already scheduled, they're really far along. It's too far. It's almost too late. It's not too late, but it's almost too late. So if we can get them earlier in the process, it's going to be better for them and us. Yes? I have some critical information that everyone can use and, and maybe you're already aware of it. I grew aware of it because two doors down from me on my block. State your name and neighborhood. I'm Tammy Kegley. I'm from Office of the Neighborhood Association. Two houses down from me. I live in a little cottage and I'm flanked by duplex, quad, ten, you know, single family. We've got a really nice mixed block. Okay. Two doors down from me was the Sam Ministries house. Everyone is familiar with the Sam Ministries uh, helping out program. Limited time housing affordable. All of a sudden, no one was there, and no one was there, and no one was there for months. I got on the phone. I called Sam. This is what's happening. Sam Ministries is selling their properties across the city. This impacts all of our neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They're selling those neighborhoods, and maybe you know already. They're selling those because they're changing the way in which they work with HUD. They're going towards vouchers for apartments, so on and so forth, rather than maintaining the properties. So this means that those little duplexes and quads across our tier one neighborhoods are going on the market. And, and this one was sold like that. It was sold to a family who then put in an apartment and did an apartment for their son and their daughter. So it was kept, you know, it, it's in a, a family now. It's no longer an affordable housing, but at least it didn't explode into a huge development out of scale with our neighborhood. So I just wanted to bring that up so that you guys know that's something that Lisa yeah. was saying, you know, be aware of it because it's not something that's been advertised in my mind. Is there some place with a list of advertisements or no. No, it's all <laughs> Yes. A lot of times these properties are sold off the market. It's really easy to tell if the property's for sale if there's a realtor sign outside, but a lot of times they're not. So I found, you out, see, I found out who the realtor was because I had this conversation with the Sam office months before it went on the market. Months before a sign went out. And I called the real estate agent's office and they did not return my calls. And other people called and they did not return their calls. The same. Um, so look at the next slide. Oh, maintain open communication with the city offices and council representatives. Don't forget that. That's really super important. I almost skipped it because um, I forgot that last line was on there. But that's that's critical. You know, knowing who to contact at zoning, who your who your city council person is, or who their zoning person is, or their planning person is in their office. They're going to be really helpful to you. Um, I know in District One, it's Christy McCain, and she has. Um, done a great job liaising with the neighborhoods um, in recent months. Go ahead. No. I didn't touch it wrong. Well. <laughs> 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 no, go backwards. Go backwards. Two times. Okay. So um, I really wanted to show this. This is Dignity's uh, Historic District Vacant Law and New Construction Inventory. Um, so this map shows their historic district. Every red dot is a vacant lot. This is Tiga. I don't know. I think Monica Savino or probably your their old architectural review committee did the work on that. Do you know Colin? Uh, I think it was Monica, but again, I'm thinking. I got it from Monica. Um, so she may be she may just be doing this herself. I don't know exactly. But this I mean this shows every vacant property in their historic district. And then it shows where a single family home has been built are the green dots. So up there you can see that's probably the Terramark development where they have the multiple single families in that big group in the box up there. Um, and then there's individual ones, or there might be two on one lot. Uh, but this is a huge tool. So think about making something like this for your neighborhood. Get a map and mark it out. Keep track of your vacant lots. Keep track of properties that you see are vulnerable. They maybe it's a vacant house that's been sitting for a long time, and then all of a sudden you see someone there kind of moving around, looking at things, or putting up some paint, and you think they might be selling. Keep an eye on that lot. That's a great idea. We just got big maps from our city council. Yeah. Both the 
a sky view and then uh, a street view. So they're each like 24 by 36. We then went and have them laminated. They're now back and we're going to use them at National Night Out so people can use uh, VISA markers and mark their vulnerability spots for whatever reason. That's super Except different. for one night we're going to have four or five hundred of them together. What's oh, your name and what neighborhood? I'm sorry, Ian Ingler and I live in Delby. Awesome. That's a fantastic idea. You know, National Night Out is a great time to capture people that may not already be involved in your community or neighborhood association um, because a lot of people come out for those events. And that's a great way to get people engaged. And people know if they have a vacant lot on their street, they're going to know where it is. They'll be able to mark down a map for you. Good job. Um, I have a little snapshot of Tilton Hills Neighborhood Plan up here because your neighborhood plan, if you have one, is really important. You may already have a map showing your vacant houses or at least for vacant lots, and that might be, um, it may be old, ours was done in 2008, so there may be some changes to it, but that might be a good place to start. But know your neighborhood plan if you have one. So if we don't, should, and should it be neighborhood plan first and then the NC? Or try to mush them together? Um, that is a good question. I really don't know. I think getting a vision of what your neighborhood what you want your neighborhood to look like is important. Um, the neighborhood plans were created with the planning department, so you'll probably need to collaborate with the city on that. Um, I, I can't definitively answer that question for you, but if you're on the list for an NCD, don't give up that spot. <laughs> don't give up that spot. Well, I have a question regarding the NCD, because yeah, uh, the thinking part is the, we're currently going through an NCD review process, but it's been, it's expected to wrap up in the next few months and it's been problematic because about 50% of the people who are on the review committee are developers, um, including three people from the same family. Um, so, um, so I guess the specific concern I have hearing about the new form based zoning, I mean, would there be problems since with all discussions have been based upon the old use phase zoning, and now if the new form based zoning comes up, uh, I'm trying to figure out if there would be any negative so, impact. So, just to clarify, the city is, has not said yeah. they're doing form based zoning. Right. Okay. The reason we latched onto it is because as part of the process okay. for the housing was this idea of form based zoning. There's a lot of talk about it, I mean, any, but the city hasn't said we're doing form okay. based zoning. Thank you. But, yes. but it's something that's out there, and we know when something's out there, it's something to start at least understanding before it does get to that place. And it was, ta and it was talked about only in context of affordable housing, like how to get affordable housing in neighborhoods and, and, and have it. And they're, so they're looking at it as a possibility, and I think that's what the committee is really about, is determining if this is a good fit for San Antonio. Um, I think as far as your NCD, I mean, so I don't live in one, so take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I think that's where it's really important to have that communication and relationship with your city offices and your council office so that they understand, so they can keep a perspective of who's advocating for what. And, and I know that requires trust um, in the city departments, and I know that that can be challenging because many people have been burned in the past, but um, I do think that if we can work to rebuild that trust, it will be the most beneficial thing we can do for our neighborhoods. Not to say to let our guards down, but I just think we need to foster that relationship and, and um, I, I should say cultivate that relationship. Um, I think I'm sorry to just jump in there, but as yeah. an association, I would also check with the rest of your membership. So if those voices that are dissenting are not representing the majority of your neighborhood or their voices, then then that's not equitable. Mm -hmm. And get the rest of your membership to really get involved and bring mm -hmm. that to the attention of, of city leaders. Well, and, and we know that just showing up to meetings can be impactful, right? So have other members of your community show up to those meetings and sit there and watch. And then if things are going too far one way or the other, they can speak up. And even if they don't have a vote, if they're not on the committee, I mean, I don't know exactly how the NCD committee process is working, but Having the numbers there to back you up is really, really helpful. So sometimes it's just about showing up and being able to see. Yeah, and I'd like to add something to that that I've kind of observed is that uh, 
our councilman, District 1, I don't know how many of y'all are in District 1. Okay, so. Who are you and what name? Oh, Mary Johnson, Juana Vista Terrace. Um, so, it's so important, I know now, that we go to those meetings that our councilmen, our council people ask us to come to because if they don't have us there backing them, they can't go to the city manager and planning and development services because, like what you said, the developers have all the, the room at the table because we're not going there and taking up our space at the table. So our council people cannot defend us if we don't go to those meetings and get behind them and, and, and say, and so they can show them, these are my constituents, these are the people that vote for me, and they're here and they have this seat at the table. And uh, I think our council person was so happy at that, uh, the AIA meeting when, I can't even remember his name, but he was from the city manager's office. He was so proud at how many people showed up. And I could tell that he wanted uh, that person. Do you remember his name, Cynthia? No. I can't remember his name, but he had, um, he was proud because he was like, like, look, these are our constituents and they do care and they do deserve a seat at the table. And so one of the ways to do that is, you know, we do these meetings and these meetings are among neighborhood leadership, you know, whether you're on board or not, you're neighborhood leaders. Like, it's not enough for you to go home and go, okay, that was interesting, I'll think about that in the door. You have to share this with the community. Mm -hmm. I mean, and get different neighborhood voices and, and have everybody part of this conversation or really we're just spinning our wheels. Because even though this is pretty impressive in your neighborhood leadership, you have to take that. Like I do t a tier one uh, thing to our board and, you know, and in our neighborhood and in our newsletter, you know, updates from tier one. Here are some important issues that are coming up or in our neighborhood. So that's, that's also important. And how do you establish a plan? Do you, like after you get, talk to your committee and community and everything, do you go to a district? Plan? Yeah. The West Side that? is trying to do that. And it's so, not, uh, not the, I think you are reaching out to the planning department. Um, I, I reach out to your council, your council person. Yeah, reach to your council person first um, and ask them, that, tell them you're interested in making a neighborhood plan for your neighborhood. Do you think we can speak to you? Or is it a different question? Well, it's part of what we're okay, discussing. Yeah. Um, I'm Denise Homer in Government Hill, and um, a, a group of our neighborhood went to City Council on August 2nd, and I appreciate everything you're all doing. But um, I think that we have to bring them to the light that the city's already decided what they want to do. Mm -hmm. um, we went and we fought against redevelopment in our neighborhood. We're sore. We had rezoning. We fought several months throughout the summer and had to go on August 2nd. Um, it's just obvious that there are this in district too. He won't discuss anything with us anymore. Replace him. Replace yeah. him. Replace him. Replace him. Replace him. Okay. Yeah. So what we're dealing with is not yes. only the fact that as a community, as a neighborhood, for everybody here, I think um, a lot of people have to be aware of what's happening within their own neighborhood associations. Right. Because of our research and our information that we had to go ahead and just find out that the rumors were true. Mm -hmm. We did find out that the rumors were true. Mm -hmm. um, our president for our neighborhood association lives and works in Tara Mark's property. Mm -hmm. So we mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. being influenced mm -hmm. by that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when we're having developers already infiltrate our neighborhood mm -hmm. association, are we going to have a voice with city council? We didn't have a voice. So our membership has, has declined. We've been removed from membership from our association because we were the dissenting, dissenting vote from the voice at city council. So they want to stop us. They want to go ahead and cease the citizens from having a voice. Because they are working with developers. Mm -hmm. um, not only is that an issue, it's the fact that when we do have an issue with the city now, we have meetings with them. They don't want to be with us anymore. Because we're over 250 residents who want questions answered, and they won't meet with us anymore. So I really appreciate all of this, and I think we need to work you know, even stronger because we have the West Side now concerned about this. And some of the meetings I've attended, they've actually said, we're not concerned with home ownership anymore. We want renters. 
That's what they said at the summit. So my suggestion, yes. my, my suggestion is to invite media. If yes. you have a meeting yes. with yes. your council office and you're getting that kind of response, invite the media. Yes. Invite NAPCAS, um, reach out to Rivard, reach out to, there's a new one called the SA uh, the Express News, and if you need contacts, let me know. But and also getting, some of getting the word out, because that's, if, if they're not being held accountable um, just by the fact that you have 250 people in your community and that's not holding them accountable, then maybe the city, the greater city, um, needs to know what's going on. And maybe getting other council offices seeing what's happening yes. is going to hold them accountable. I the city council, which I actually told them, I'm going to have to have a crystal ball here. The market is changing. We're already going to have a bubble. Yeah. Loans are not going to be available. And what happened this week? USA pulled away over a hundred homeowner loans. Yeah. No, they, they, took, they got rid of their loan department, which which was no was good. Job. I'm sorry. Their, let's their loan let's get back to so, so, so it's But maybe I make a suggestion for you. It's, it's Now you're in the battle. But for those neighborhoods that are about to go into this battle, it's important that your neighborhood charter, and I know Toby Hill's struggling with some of these issues, that it's it's that no one can take over. I remember in my own neighborhood, we had a, a big struggle. Someone said, we're going to take over the board. It's like, go ahead. It's like, our board doesn't make decisions. Our board facilitates decisions. And and no one can say, well, you can't be on this committee. Everyone can be on the committee. It's it's The moment that you start putting those kind of boundaries in your neighborhoods, think about if it's someone you disagree with being in power. And then think about your charter in light of that. That it has to be, we don't charge dues. We put out a newsletter in Spanish and English. We... You know, and lots of people disagree in my neighborhood about a lot of things, but that you know, that's what we're there is to talk it out. As a board member, I don't have the right to say, well, this is what Beacon Hill thinks, unless it's supported by the charter or it's a, a vote from our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that's something else. Beacon Hill has also been doing is we've been strengthening our bylaws because we are seeing what's happening in other neighborhoods, and we're trying to be proactive. Uh, there's a lot of money to be made in our near downtown neighborhoods, and um, it is wise to strengthen those. Bylaws, if you have them, or get your community, um, make a new community association, do what needs to be done to protect your community um, and to make sure that the people who live there are being represented. Um, one more suggestion Wait. for you is to reach out to your state representatives. So that's a good suggestion. Yeah, I think yeah. going on. Um, I really want to just show you this last slide and then we can do any other questions. Um, this is the development portal that I created for the Tobin Hill um, Community Association website. Uh, this was actually created on the suggestion of just one of our members. Um, she's not on the board. She joined our zoning task force and she made this suggestion. Um, so you can kind of see underneath that where it's a pretty visual portal. It's, it's on tobinhill.org. There's a tab that says development and it has on here a link to our neighborhood plan, which is on the city's website. So the developers can access that easily when they if they Google Tobin Hill Community Association this page is going to come up um, it's one of the tabs at the top uh, there's also a link right here to the historic guidelines there's a link to email um, our historic preservation committee chairperson or zoning task force chairperson um, there's an address search tool if people aren't sure if their house is in our historic district or not because Tobin Hill is not all historic some of it is and some of it isn't so um, there's contact information, there's information for development, um, whether it's a property owner who <coughs> just wants to fix up their porch or somebody who's trying to build something new. We're trying to take steps to make it easier for developers to reach out to the community earlier on in the process. Um, we don't want them to have an excuse to say, oh, well, we tried, but the neighborhood just didn't respond to us. We want to put it all out there for them to be able to get a hold of us. Also, we have our meeting based listed. So um, that's that's one suggestion. I know there are a bunch of other questions. That was the last slide that I had. So, so, so you created that for your neighborhood? I did. I mean, I'm managing the website right now. So um, I we got the suggestion, and I thought it was a good suggestion. So I made it, and I showed it to the board, and the board said, yeah, that's cool. So the, yeah, it's up right now. So we have a we have a little bit, um, which I'm glad that you're next to uh, But I want to make sure that please say your name, your neighborhood association, and please keep your um, remarks um, brief. 
because it'd be respectful that other people have things to say. Let's not use any names of, of any organizations or developers or this is on Nowcast. And yeah, we're not here to, to pick on or to talk about one specific thing. We're, it's not in general. Great. We don't want to demonize any developers. So you had a comment. I'm Jack Finger I'm with Beacon Hill. My question is, what will success look like for this program? What measurable goals are there? Where are they? And uh, what, so that you will know that you have fulfilled them, and to the point where this program, this initiative, this, uh, well, proposed bureaucracy, it can go away. I think that's a, an excellent question. What does success look like? I think um, it's going to look different in any neighborhood, um, depending on the neighborhood you live in. I think success is going to mean something different to different people. Um, we do know that we need more housing, so I think getting more affordable housing, um, getting more people who need it into housing that they can afford is going to be successful. Um, ultimately, I think um, most of us are here because we care about our neighborhoods. So I think if we can have a successful dialogue with the city and with those who are looking to develop in our neighborhoods and create something um, or not, right? The, the committee is initially going to be established to decide if by right zoning and a form based code is going to be successful for San Antonio. I think that committee. <coughs> Determining that will be its own success, and then if, it, if we do create a form of code for by right zoning, um, that will be a longer process, but I think it's going to look different in every neighborhood. The I, needs in the north side are different than the needs on the south side. The needs on the west side are different than the needs on the east side. So, but I, I think, think that's something we should keep in mind. What does success look like? We need, to, we need to determine that and go to those meetings and say what, you know, ask, keep asking them to, to make a, this is what this should look like at the end. Right. I think I think that's actually something we should all just like keep in the back of our mind. What mm -hmm. does success look like? Does success look like not changing anything ever? I don't. I don't think so. Not in my neighborhood. My neighborhood has room for more people. Mm -hmm. um, but what does that look like for the end result? I don't know. I think we still need to decide that. So good question. Yes. Here. Um, my name is Level New York, and I'm from District Six. Uh, first of all, I'd like to ask, how many veterans do we have here? Please raise your hand. Okay, uh, we have the young, and we have the, the ones who have a lot of experience. But what it is, is uh, veterans uh, in my neighborhood, or from uh, Vietnam era, and then also the, uh, uh, the, the new... Uh, Right. Okay, now, what it is is uh, these veterans, sometimes they qualify for uh, a pension disability. The problem is that the U.S. government recognizes that this pension is not to be included. Also, ACOT is the other organization that don't include the uh, the pension of the veteran disability. How about the city? Is the city uh, recognizes this as uh, not to be included in the income levels? Because now you have uh, a veteran that, uh, for some reason, uh, he got injured, and of course he gets social security a little bit, but he's a little bit over. The mentor. So uh, that's uh, one of the things I'd like to ask. Also, uh, where are you getting your funding from? Is this going to be on a yearly basis, uh, or if there's charter changes, uh, are you going to cut on that? Those are two questions. Those are really good questions. I don't work for the city. So I cannot answer those questions. Um, I can tell you that the funding is talked about in this. Um, there's a whole section on funding, um, so I encourage you to read that. Um, and 
I, I really can't answer the other questions, um, but I can help you find out if you want. Or we can, um, there, I, I do know there's other programs just that I heard about at the Housing Summit. Like I know um, Habitat for Humanity has a sister organization for people, Habitat for Humanity is for people who are making up to 80% of AMI, and then they have a sister organization called Cross Timber Homes, I think, that is for people for 80% AMI and above. So if they're not in one, they can qualify for the other. But I don't know, you know, the specific situations that you're talking about, but we can look for So what is your name and neighborhood? It is District uh, 6. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, okay, go ahead, sir. I, I know many of you. I'm Tommy Atkinson. I was the uh, state representative for District 119 for a number of years. Uh, but more uh, lengthily, uh, Commissioner Support for 16 years. And uh, I've had the unincorporated areas, I've had the incorporated areas in my precinct. But uh, I want to congratulate Tier 1. I think it's a wonderful thing to gather us together. I, I had uh, begun a group to do education and membership until the Neighborhood Resource Center went under, then we said, well, let's, we got to do that too. Uh, and all of us have to. But uh, Ann England is our executive director, and Liz Trainer is on the board, and there's probably several of y'all. But the main thing is to get uh, a voice in government, because if you're not careful, the money forces will absolutely drown you out. Yeah. They have a mission, and they're serious about it. Uh, we wake up and go to work, they wake up, and do their lobbying thing. Mm -hmm. And I know because I've been, you know, in public office, but I wanted to uh, congratulate y'all for what you're doing here. I know that the Bowen Center would love to work with y'all and, and make sure we're, we're safe for it. There's so much work to be done. <laughs> Nobody can say, well, they're going to do this. No, we all have to do that. So anyway, thanks for all y'all being here. And I'm looking forward to working with y'all as we roll through the process. Thank you so much. The Bowen Center is an excellent resource and, you know, someone to partner with. Uh, it's not just Tier 1, but we're, we're focused on the downtown neighborhoods where they're focused on all the neighborhoods. So it's, it's anyway. Is there anybody else that has a comment about the subject? And then Amelia will be the last to speak. Um, um, regarding the subject of displacement and uh, people being effective by being Forced out of home mainly because of taxes or anything like that. Uh, my name is Richard Costa. Our, we have a 501c3 nonprofit. We help people protest their property taxes for free, regardless of income, regardless of where you live in San Antonio. We so we try to help people out with protesting property taxes for free, and also um, in the development we are getting into development. We're going to be trying to start building homes under a hundred thousand dollars, focusing on people with fifty to 60% AMI uh, ranges, or if lower, a possibility, but we're going to be uh, building an infill, we're looking to that, we're working in, on designs, and uh, District 5 is the one that we're focusing on right now, because um, that's where we see the need um, currently, and so just wanted to let you guys know. What's your phone number? Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sure you have some line, I need yeah. your card. <laughs> Mi ciudad es mi casa, my city is my home. Oh, thank you so much. And maybe you can ask him for his phone number afterwards since this is going to be a tape. Um, you were next. Yes. Thank you. Um, we are involved in a, a constant name and, battle. Name and, name and, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Greg Rips, uh, Highland Park Neighborhood Association, uh, just southeast of downtown. If you've ever been to the little red barn restaurant, and you know, where the, uh, <laughs> yeah. is, that seems to be the most famous landmark. In uh, we did uh, uh, score a victory last January. We learned the plans to uh, place a 96 uh, uh, unit uh, apartment complex in the middle of our neighborhood in the place of the uh, place that was originally a supermarket and had become the uh, uh, Moose Lodge. Well, the developer had offered uh, uh, Moose Lodge a, a large amount of money, uh, 
but in the process they were uh, this NRP, well, I shouldn't say the name. We don't like that. Uh, the developer uh, had to qualify for some incentives and, and tax credits. Uh, we did not get the support of our city council person. We did not get the support of city council, which supported uh, 20 similar projects. Uh, which went to a state agency, which uh, scored the points that they got. Uh, we wrote to our state representative who declared his uh, neutrality, which did not give them points, but it didn't really you know, give us points either. And uh, we encouraged our members to write. Uh, we learned that they did not get the credits they were looking for, and that the uh, people at the Moose Lodge said that they had withdrawn the offer. And I don't know how much uh, effort we can take credit for, but uh, we'd like to think that some of this uh, pressure that we exerted did have an effect on them. Uh, we're not completely out of the water. Something else could come along because the uh, property still has the same zoning as someone else could make them the, the, the blue spot an offer. And uh, we are exploring other defensive uh, avenues to take in the meantime. But um, I just want to encourage people that sometimes you do score a victory. And uh, uh, all I know is that when they had a meeting to inform us of the plans in such a way that it seemed to be already a done deal, that 150 people in the neighborhood showed up and uh, were almost to a person in opposition. And so we can make a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I'm Diane Duster at the Ingram Hills Neighborhood Association. <coughs> I guess I had a comment and a question. One was neighborhood conservation districts were mentioned earlier. We were the third neighborhood conservation district in the city. I was under the impression they are no longer facilitating neighborhood conservation districts. Well, um, I, I believe that's true in terms of the creation of new neighborhood plans uh, because this came up during uh, our work with the city planner for uh, SA Tomorrow um, because we're in the Midtown plan and that's one of the ones that they're initially working with. Mm -hmm. And at first we were told that, that the, all the neighborhood plans were going away or, or would be ignored and would not be uh, recognized by the new Midtown plans. Um, there was a big pushback on that, at least in some of the neighborhoods for the Midtown zone. Um, and then we were told that, well, um, we still haven't seen the final language. We were given lip service at one of the last meetings to say, well, yes, you know, we will recognize the existing plans um, uh, with the exception that if there's conflict with the new Midtown plan, um, those will override any prior midtown plans, and um, and there was apparently some encouragement, you know, for people who had existing plans to see if they wanted to update them. But you know, I was I was given the impression that they won't support the development of new neighborhood plans. But I'm but talking about the conservation plan. districts. Oh, okay. I think there is a way. I think there is. I'm not, I don't work for the city, but it seems like what I heard is they are still doing NCDs. Okay. There's when a waiting I, list. Yeah, I think there's a waiting list. What, uh, not our last community association meeting, but the one before the representative for our council office uh, mentioned that you can get on the list to create an NCD. So I don't, I, I did contact your council office to verify, but I, I believe that you can still do it. I just think it's a lengthy process and it takes a lot of um, city resources as well and so um, that's why there's a waiting list. Does anyone, that was my impression. Does anyone know when the last one was approved? Because I've been searching all around. It used to be much easier to find the list on the city website. The city website. I can't so hard to find it now and to me it looks like the last one might have been in 2011. I don't know. I would suggest calling development services probably. My, my question was, do you know how many people or how many slots there are on the technical working group? Um, 
and discussed. But when we find out that is something we'll put out through Tier 1, I think that's important information. We're going to start sending updates and putting them on the website. These are updates of things we've talked about. Graciela, did you? Well, there are comments also. I mean, in terms of the technical working groups, you said you have to know. So can Tier 1 offer another workshop just to learn the language for folks that might be interested but don't have that capacity That's right now? An excellent. We've been toying with the idea of sort of city planning 101, or I used to say city planning for dummies. Like like those of us who this is not, a, a, this. Some, some people come to this as former architects or city planners. I'm a former English teacher. Like the learning curve for me is straight up in the air. And a lot of us are the same way. We don't, we're still struggling to learn the basics. So that's, I might be sending out an email about, do some of you want to sit down just at a table and let's do the 101, let's do the really simplified version of this and start to build, build a scaffold so you can create, to start putting more information so you can sit on these committees and go to the meetings and go, okay, I know what they're talking about. And, and, unless you're like me, who's like, I have no idea what they're talking about at the time. So let's, let's do that together. I'm gonna to put an email to do that. That's an excellent solution. And, and then to follow up, I mean, at least in Alpha Vista, maybe Beacon Hill or whatever, that, as you all mentioned, you have more engineers or architects that are sympathetic how can we get some of them, especially in District 5, because as you have mentioned, Tier 2 or whatever, the near west side is the place that they're coming after. And again, the way the city has worked with the developers is getting code compliance officers to not help knock down land, you know, home after home after home, many of them historic. Um, and so we just have a lot of empty lots. But, and again, being ch always challenging the city, <laughs> right. um, because it's poor people that are losing housing. And they're, you know, yeah. so, you. so how do we do that? Because now that housing bond money is targeted starting in the District 5, so the, you know, right now with that $20 million, right now in Buena Vista, they're going to buy land that's a million dollars. But what I'm understanding is the developers will only be charged as, as little as $10,000 for that million dollars. So one of the things that West Side has done is started the West Side neighborhood Association Coalition WINAC. And they had the mayor at a meeting for two and a half hours, including all their elected officials. Like, I don't know what your neighborhood, but my neighborhood couldn't accomplish that. So right now, they are an important ally, and it's about, you, you're, you got him there for two and a half hours. I mean, I don't know how much he heard or how much he's gonna act on, but the idea that, that that's what we all need to do is right. to is to start you know start forming local coalitions as well and combine your voices and so um, do you want to do that one or not? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes. I'm Lynn Fanatic, I live in Tilden Hill. Um, I went to the city's website and uh, searched NCD and you get all this it's ten pages of NCD stuff and some of it is very current. Like the one, it looks like there's one in the works right now for, um, uh, let's see what this was, uh, April Hills. So, yeah, this this is like right now, 2018. It was still so yeah, it's, I just they used to have them all listed yeah, on one. Yeah, yeah they, they are still. They are still. I, I it's under development services on their third place. In their place. So, yeah, I'm I'm done. So, um, thank you all. So I have an invitation. No uh, sports. A place that was threatened by. Uh, I get emotional because uh, these are the folks that uh, actually are part of an important uh, area where one time um, Eleanor Reservoir came in, kind of kind of walked through this neighborhood uh, and, and thought that affordable housing was, was important, right? So there's going to be an exhibit uh, joined by uh, Ms. Peranza Peace and Justice Center, the West Side Preservation Alliance. And it, it documents the history of the Alazana Project Works, San Antonio's oldest, largest housing development. And today, from 4 to 6, we want to invite everybody to come and join us. Uh, and at one time, at one time, this place uh, was uh, was threatened by uh, demolition. Yes. So. Um,
it's still being threatened. It still is. So we can continue to be a part of it. Um, so I just want to invite everybody. And I got more invitation, invitations and other things. This is one more. Plaza Guadalupe. They want to permanently fence this beautiful uh, plaza, which um, uh, a lot of it, uh, plazitas, like what we think about is uh, what, what is open and people can come and enjoy it. So they want to permanently fence it with lots and lots of money. So there's not a conversation about that. But I have other information here. Uh, please come by and take an invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Tony? Uh, yeah, just a couple of announcements. Yeah, we're about to close. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, check on the uh, t1nc.org website, okay? Uh, what we're doing is we're developing quick links to the city uh, website. Okay. Instead of going through the city website and going through the cavernous uh, yeah. approach. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, t1nc.org, okay? Under uh, resources. Uh, there's quick links to the city's uh, website, such as STR, Indo Development, things such as that. So we're trying to make it easy for folks to actually get into the city website and go to those specific uh, uh, areas that they're interested in. That's great. Okay. Thank you. So, also, uh, calendar events uh, this uh, coming week. This uh, week, there's uh, AIA uh, events, uh, which is on a calendar of events on t1nc.org. October, I think the 6th, uh, District 1 is having a land use uh, uh, presentation at their office. So check the calendar events on the city, uh, on the t1nc.org uh, website. And then, uh, it's, yeah, historic homeowners, that's on the city, uh, that's on the t1nc.org website as well. Okay. And then one final comment, one final comment. Uh, I'm on the city's task force for IBZ. Into development zone uh, draft ordinance that are coming up. Uh, I volunteered to the Westside Coalition to do a presentation on IDC so people have a better understanding of what's coming down the road with regards to uh, IDC and the new residential R1, R2 uh, uh, zoning uh, classification. So if there is an interest for us to do a presentation to your neighborhood association, uh, just yeah, that's IDC. So we had 42 people today, over 26 neighborhoods, all council districts except four. We need to work on four. <laughs> we now reach to four. And yet, and Saldana has expressed concern that there doesn't seem to be a strong neighborhood leadership in that district. So reach out to those folks. Um, so make sure the information today gets out to your neighborhoods. We have started to have partnerships. We're just exploring partnerships with the suburban neighborhoods, but you know, we're more centered around downtown. And so we've had several uh, leaders from coalitions out there to see how we can intersect and, and have more of an impact to all council districts. So thank you for being here today. And can I just one? Yes. I, I just want to say that this fight for our city, our inner neighborhoods, just our neighborhoods in general, is so worth fighting for, and we're never going to have the power that the developers and the lobbyists, aka attorneys have, and their money, but we have our vote, and that is very powerful, and they know which districts vote, and the more people you can get out to vote, I don't care how they vote, but if they know you are voting, you're going to get their attention, and they're going to know that they need to listen to a neighborhood when they say we don't care. They know that they're going to have to listen if you get people out to vote. And what I think success looks like is us having an equal seat at that table. When they get in a room, we're there too, and we get to form what is happening in our city. Uh, I'm the outsider. I'm Larry Lamborn. I'm from District 9 Alliance. I'm also president of the North Central Thousand Oaks Neighborhood Association. And the reason I'm here this morning is because Tier 1 is very, very important. So is the District 9 Alliance. And as Cynthia has just mentioned, if we work singly, if we work as islands sort of in the sea, we are not going to amount to a hill of beans. But if we do work together, 
and we speak with one voice, the Northeast Alliance, District 10, District 9 Alliance, Tier 1. All of us working together and speaking with one voice, then I think we will be heard. That's why we're here. Amen. Well, we'll leave on that. Thank you for coming. <laughs>